Welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Join us here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first. Hello, this is Charlie Sheely. Charlie Sheely, how you doing? Fantastic. Is this Alice? It is. Aren't you excited? We're going to talk about I, your book. Oh, yes. <laughs> I've heard of your reputation. I have a brother that lives in, in New York area. Uh-oh. Eat on the street or something like that? I'm a street reporter. Yes, I am. Yeah, that's uh, very cool. It's a fun, it's it's fun every day. Living the dream. Well, I've had a few nightmares myself. <laughs> right. Dealing with screamers, liars, and criers. Of course. I said, well, title of this book must be kids. Wrong again, aren't we? <laughs> that's right. It's, it's not uh, kids. What is it? They, they, people sometimes act like children, little brats. I never okay. I never experienced that ever. <laughs> <laughs> So you just failed your lie detector. <laughs> what inspired your book, your your uh, your work? I have a brother who's also a consummate salesperson. I happen to be on a cross-country trip. His dog doesn't like to fly. So he wanted to have company because his wife didn't want to ride with him. She likes to fly. And so I was his partner from uh, California to uh, Houston, Texas. And on the way to occupy ourselves, we talked about sales stories. And our business exploits. And by the time we got to his place in Houston, he turned to me and he says, Charlie, why don't people know how to sell anymore? And it clicked. Uh, that meant uh, it's really been a neglected field in the schools and, and, and mo even most training. Uh, you, you don't really know what to do. And this is a way that people can learn in a fun way with my book. You're, you're prepping them because what they're going to run into is screamers, liars, and criers? Or are you talking about the salespeople? <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm talking about prepping people. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And it covers all the basics of what is what it is to be a successful presenter. Now, remember, sales is not just good getting up there and, and selling a product. It's also selling ideas. And sometimes it's even selling yourself when you go to a job interview. Well, I mean, I have to say, it's always been my belief or my feeling that like good salespeople are born. You, you either have an aptitude for that, you have the personality, you don't care what people think, you're not afraid to make that phone call, you're not afraid to stand up, you believe in your product. It's more than that, huh? Actually, it is a lot of effort and training. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into being a very effective salesperson. Like what? What's the most important thing? For example, I did my research on you. I looked into what you did, and then I that formed a basis of association. Okay. Okay, so you, you, you want to learn about your client, your target, and sometimes it has to be really quick, like if you're doing cold call sales or something like that. So you want to try to figure out the person as quickly or as effectively as you can. Then you better darn well know your material. If you can't make eye contact with a person, if you're doing a face-to-face -face, that's not as good as if you can. Mm. And therefore, I learned a long time ago to operate without notes and backup. And it's much more effective to look somebody in the eye. You know, it's interesting. My son did Cutco sales. Knives. Yes, knives. And I was a little concerned because Cutco kind of strikes me as a little cultish. And they go on to college campuses and they recruit college kids. But let me tell you what, that kid, he learned, he learned about organization. He, like you said, he learned about doing background checks on people, really knowing the people he was going to talk to, really knowing his product. But I have to tell you, it's a great product. Don't you have to have a good product? It, well, the thing is, uh, I remember the pet rock. <laughs> I remember the pet rock. Yeah. That wasn't a great product. It was a fun product, wasn't it? I mean, well, it was an, it was amusing. There was a certain value to it from the standpoint of of uh, how, how the person described it. He tried to attribute certain attributes to the rock to make it special, right? And uh, that's really where it comes down to is how you dress up the product and how you make it 
their product, not just yours. How you can transfer those feelings of, that you have about the product to them in such a way that they can hardly resist it. I, I refer to that as I may not be able to sell ice to Eskimos, but I sure can sell them the refrigerators to put it in. <laughs> what are some of the things that you have sold? I did cold call sales on commission for a uh, call center. It's no longer in existence because several of these call centers in the past were pretty much fly by night. Yeah. I called them meat grinders and uh, I went out there and I solicited for them and I was one of their top salesperson from right off the bat. Because I didn't take no for an answer. I was really good with uh, dealing with re- uh, rejection. That is definitely and, uh, key. It's a special thing. It is very special because, you know, nothing feels better than rejection. Nothing, nothing quite like it. Well, when you succeed in spite of it, that's when it really feels good. So what's the key there? How do you nail someone who's like dead set against what it is, whatever it is you're selling? Uh, let me give you an example. Um, I did some work for the state of Minnesota when they launched their their version of Obamacare. They had a lot of problems with their systems design. And I was already uh, had worked at a call center that was selling uh, Obamacare and the CEO wanted to know how many salespeople they had. Uh, I mean, customer service people they had that were uh, in, in the insurance field. And one of the directors says, we don't have any of those crooks. So there was an internal bias against anybody that had an insurance mm-hmm. license. At, at that time and he says go oh, no these people know what they're talking about you go out and get some people well i was one of them that was hired and we had this one gentleman that called in every day he was a broker so he wasn't getting paid because the system wasn't working right and we got a nickname for him we call him hollering hank because that's what he do the very first thing you get on the phone he start screaming at people and because I was uh, I was rated number one out of 219 uh, reps at the top tier, Colley decided they're going to put me against that hollering Hank and see what happens. Well, I let Hank holler for about 20 seconds, and I said, hold it, Hank, hold it. I want to savor this moment. He says, what? And then right after that, I said, well, you remind me of my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did is I took away his ammo. I disarmed him. Yeah. I showed that yelling at me is not going to take him anywhere. And right. then I followed up after right. that. I said, now you can con- continue to make me feel good by yelling at me, or you can tell me what your problems are because I'm the best. And two things happened after that. Whenever Hank called again, he never hollered at anybody. And he also tried to get me every time. So that's how you disarm people. How do you lay out your book? You know, there's a lot of books on how to be a good salesman out there. You know, you really have to set yours apart for me. First of all, I'm doing the Aesopian uh, philosophy uh, where I give a story and then the next chapter is a moral to the story. Okay. But uh, I also have a Mary Poppins style because the story that I give is humorous generally or amazing or just highly unusual. But there's a draw to it. There's a certain fascination to the, to the story. So uh, how are you telling people about this book, Charlie? Everybody I talk to. <laughs> yeah. There's free newspapers where you buy yourself some advertising. It's a story, but you still still advertising. Tell it. You're going to try to get on television, radio, local radio, uh, and uh, do some local advertising. I'm working with um, a website uh, developer to set up a website so I can sell individually. And I'm re- recovering all those emails I've had through Kingdom Come and all the contacts I have from my education and businesses and all that. And it's work, but you know what? It's fun. I enjoy doing it. Yeah. One thing that I run into a lot is people don't realize how much work you have to put into this. I mean, even though, you know, they send out news releases for you and, you know, they, they do a lot of work with you, but only you, this is your baby. Only, you have to get behind this book. And I have people say to me, you know, but I never leave my house and I'm not good in front of people. And it's like, you have to really get over that hurdle. I've had people have great success because they know how to work the Facebook and, and Twitter and, you know, Instagram, and they've had great success and others just... You know, grassroots, hit the ground running, hand out flyers. There's a, I talked to a truck driver who hands out books when he's on the road. You know, he stops. 
you know, to eat or whatever, opens up the back of his truck and sells books out of the back. I mean, hey, whatever works, but I think it's... <laughs> well, I've already went to my public library and dropped off a book with the person that's in charge of buying. All right. Well, let me know how you make out, Charlie. Well, you know, it's it's an honor to speak with you, ma'am, and I'm really thrilled that this, that you were selected. Uh, you have an excellent reputation out in this in the Big Apple, and it's really nice. <laughs> it's really nice to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll buy anything from you now. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Charlie. <laughs> well, at least you know I'm happy. That's right, and that's important. Oh, you bet. It's a good thing you to do. do. Take care. Thank you for calling. You got it. Bye-bye. Vicki L. Gardner has written a wonderful children's book series entitled The Adventures of Darby, and her latest is entitled Darby's Polka Dots and Pretties. How you doing, Vicki? I'm good. How are you doing, Alice? Good. It's nice to talk to you again. Yes, it is. How many Adventures of Darby have we discussed? We have discussed two, Dullberry Deer and Tall Town. Well, here we go again. Yes, yes. I'm excited. And all of these stand alone, right? They can be read alone, though they do kind of tie together a little bit as well. They flow a little bit, but if you read one without the others, they'd be their their own little book. Yeah, because I'm wondering, for people who are just learning about the adventures of Darby right now, what should we tell them before we explain this latest book, Darby's Polka Dots and Pretties? So we can tell them that Darby's adventures started out in Dulberry Dare in the Cave of the Haunted, where he met his his newest friend. And that friend Shirka joins Darby on his adventure through Tall Town to find Shirka's family. They find a lost puppy, they bond. And, and and that's a little bit of the backstory for Darby to get them into the polka dots and pretties. Okay. So what's going on now, Vicki? So polka dots and pretties is a tribute to mothers. And of course, we can't have that tribute to mothers without Darby going through some sort of adventure, crisis, so on and so forth. Um, so Darby sets off to gather pretties or flowers for, for his mother. Um, as a tribute um, in the Festival of Pretties. Um, along the way, they get distracted and Darby encounters a meadow of beautiful green glowing pretties that he's never seen before. So of course he gathers up the pretties and he puts some purple ones and some pink ones into the bouquet as well for his mother and gathers up his friend, little uh, Korak, his little um, wagon friend, lizard, dragon combination. Um, they go on home and they encounter Darby's friend, Charlize. And she's just surprised and startled at what Darby looks like when he comes back home. So of course, Darby has now been changed by these green glowing pretties and he has to figure out how to eliminate the polka dots on his body. The glowing green pretties are not good for meites. So his mother helps him heal through that. But what comes of that is Darby noticing that he's a little bit different after that. He's, he's a little bit different than everybody else. He's a changed meite and he becomes very proud of that. And so part of the story is recognizing who we are, the little differences as, as well as paying tribute to mothers. So, so that's where we are with Polka Dots and Pretties. So sweet. I love this. My mother passed away 17 years ago. So one of the reasons I wrote this story was a tribute to my mother, uh, remembering her um, every Mother's Day. Um, so yes, this, this uh, book itself has a uh, very special meaning to me um, and was part of the inspiration for writing this book as well. How many more stories do we have left? I hope to write at least two or three more. However, Dullberry Dare, Tall Town, and Polka Dots and Pretties will all be in a Spanish version as well. So I'm working on those um, in addition to hopefully writing some more uh, stories for Darby. How are you doing that? So I translate all the stories using a translator, and we, we have yet to put out the first version, but they pretty much take the illustrations we did in the original book, put it with the 
Spanish content and we put the book together and we'll publish it. So we've got two of those in work right now. That's great, Vicki. How, how are you making out getting the word out? So I'm part of Facebook. I do Instagram posts. I participated in the Tucson Festival of Books in 2022, did some book signings as well as promoting the stories there in talking with people. Um, I am going to be doing a presentation to my the elementary kids in my grandson's school, where I hope to promote the stories as well and share the messages with the elementary kids uh, in that setting. Yeah, that's that's really good, you know, because it's hard. It's hard for some people to get into the school systems. You know, if you don't have a direct connection, if people, you know, they need to do your background check and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy. What would you say is the most beneficial? Something that's been most beneficial is is kind of personal for me. It's the recognition of things that have happened in my life that I want to grow from and wanting to share that message with those that read my books, right? Um, where are your struggles? You know, what are your confidence issues? So writing these stories, all of the stories I've written um, has not only... Um, been fun for me to share with the readers, but it's also helped me develop me as a person uh, to see where, where I struggled, where I had confidence issues, and it's kind of helped me grow in that area. Um, And that's part of my goal too, in my books is helping others grow in, in their struggles, helping them to, to resolve those things and feel confident in who they are as a person. And it's never too late to do that, right? Never, never. You always have time to to feel good about yourself and to um, be the person you've always wanted to be. It's never too late. Do you feel like you're beginning to build an audience? I do feel like I'm beginning to build an audience. I, I get a lot of feedback from my books. Um, I know my books are selling. And I believe that even doing the Spanish version will even grow that audience more because in in the region that I'm in, we have a lot of people that read Spanish, speak Spanish. And I do believe that's going to boost it. But I do believe that the audience is growing. Uh, I think it grows more and more all the time. And I'm excited to to continue to build that. That is so great. That's so great for, you know, anyone listening right now. It's great to hear that you are finding success and it doesn't seem like you're killing yourself. I mean, I have people say to me, well, I'm going to try to get to New York. I want to fly somewhere. I want to go crazy. You know, it's like, would you agree? Just start where you are. Yes. um, Don't expect huge things right off the bat. I did. That was a mistake. You go through that. I want big things. And then you go through a real stage of of horrible disappointment. But if you take it slow, you enjoy the ride, you enjoy the writing and sharing those messages, the rest will come. But enjoy it is the message I would say. And, and that's what I'm doing right now is just enjoying that sharing my books, seeing the delightful smiles on the kids faces when they have my books. Um, and sharing those stories. Um, that's what the writing is all about. And that's what is, it's all about being an author um, and writing those stories, in my opinion. Uh, that's where the fun comes from. And you got you to enjoy it or what's the point, right? You do. Otherwise, it's a job, right? I already have one of those. I don't need another one. So enjoy the writing, enjoy the sharing, and you'll, you get a lot out of it. You'll be very fulfilled. Just quickly, where are you located? I'm in Littleton, Colorado. We do have quite a number of um, Spanish, Hispanic people in the uh, Colorado area. Um, So I thought I would share with them my message as well. There wasn't any reason to um, not do that. Um, I love expanding. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. It was great chatting with you again. All right, Vicki, and we'll talk again soon. Next up, J.R. Patrick, who writes for her children and grandchildren in Knoxville, Tennessee. The name of her book, The Enchanted Carousel. What inspired you? Well, since I was just a very young child, I have loved carousels. In fact, my daughter says I'm a carousel snob because I prefer the old wooden carousels, not these new plastic things. And then in high school, I was dating a young man who was into mythology. So I followed suit. 
And, you know, that didn't last, but the mythology did. And I got quite interested in it. And actually, I'm not a person who takes things normally. I'll take something that's common, usual, and give it just a little bit of a twist to make it very unique. And that's where the story from the carousel come. It was a carousel, but. <laughs> you, you married a carousel and your love for Greek mythology. Yes. It's about uh, a teenage goddess Athena, and she has a big heart. And the mythological creatures that they are quite familiar with are disappearing or being tortured and you know mistreated. And she's very concerned about them and wants to save them. So she talks to her dad, which is Zeus. He gives her some very good advice, and she decides to build a carousel and take these creatures and put them on the carousel. All is fine until her stepmother, Hera, steps in, puts a curse on the carousel, and then pure chaos ensues. She has to find out what to do with these creatures. They're, they're not happy any longer, and how to how do I put this back together? Because she let her ego get the best of her and, you know, treated them like they were things. They ran back into the wild, back to their homes. Some of them invaded the uh, temples in Greece and decided, well, I like this here better than over there. Others just flat refused to, to go anywhere, just stayed on the carousel immobile. Immobile? They couldn't move? No, they couldn't move. See, Hera put a curse on them that after midnight, they were free to roam and do whatever. But that was kind of impossible because since there were dragons, griffins, three-headed dogs, unicorns, flying horses, they couldn't just roam around. <laughs> so Athena froze them until she could figure out what in the world to do. But what I just what I just told you just now, that's the beginning of the story. Now, now to get to get out of this chaos, she hires the greatest architects, builders, artists, and craftsmen in Olympus and the human world. Yeah, they build this carousel. Hera is jealous, puts the curse on it. So she has to go back and with each creature that she has. Uh, for instance, uh, the Minotaur. She has got to go convince him that what she can offer on the carousel is relief of uh, his misery and pain because he's in this labyrinth and he's, he just suffers. Uh, the king who claims him as his own is quite merciless and he's just stuck there. So he talks to Athena and she agrees, you know, let's get you out of here. And he's the one of the ones who stays on the carousel. Even though he's immobile for, for now, he he's happy just staying on the carousel because he's no longer being mistreated. And um, he's just content to be himself. Of course, he is no longer himself. He's now another creature. But he's happy in that body. All right. So we basically find out how we get these creatures unfrozen. Yeah, and each one has their own story. There's like 15 of them. How she gets them to the carousel, what they see their life is like. She was arrogant and just, you know, that's just what I want. So she built the carousel. And then when chaos ensued, she had to swallow her pride, let go of her ego, and find out what these creatures really wanted in order to make herself and them happy. Some of them left the carousel completely. They decided, no, that's not for me. Uh, others came back with stipulations. You know, I will come back if you will do such and such for me. Like what? Gideon the unicorn, for instance. Uh, he had a mate, Gabrielle. But Gabrielle was captured. And when they cut off her golden horn, she passed away. And when... Uh, Athena approached Gideon to come back. He said that he would if he she would leave the the teardrops in his eyes, blue teardrops, uh, and leave his horn because that was all that connected him with uh, Gabrielle. 
she agreed that yes, he could come back that way, but she put a, a large flowered wreath around his neck in memory of Gabrielle. And he was satisfied. Yes, I will come back. All right. So she basically makes peace with all of the creatures. Yes, in one way or another. Yes. And the stepmother. So it turns out the stepmother didn't want anyone else on the carousel but herself? Uh, she, yeah. She was just jealous of the relationship between Athena and her father, Zeus. And Hera was jealous of anything and anyone who came near Zeus. And, you know, her greatest pleasure was to make discomfort for someone else. And when she learned about the carousel, she thought, you know, if, if I do this to the carousel, then, you know, she's going to go find something else and Zeus will go come back to me. She's she just pure jealousy is all it was. So the moral of the story is? Well, she learned compassion for others. Athena did. How to negotiate and not, it's not all about me. It's about others around me as well. Okay. What a sweet story. I was quite pleased with it. <laughs> it started out with just a simple story about the Minotaur. And, oh, uh, okay. When I got through with the story, I thought, well, what are we going to do now? And I have a, a very good friend who lives in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and there's a wonderful carousel there. She took me to see it. And that's where the spark started for the other creatures to get me on the carousel. I, you know, I had this one, the Minotaur, but, you know, you need more than one for a carousel. So. <laughs> well, it sounds like a very fun ride. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Oh, I've enjoyed every moment of it. Thank you. <laughs> I was so excited to talk to our next author because her title spoke to me, Mac the Sock. Welcome to the Sock World, Josefina A. Janeo. Yes, that's me. How are you? Yes, ma'am. I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. You sound like you're uh, somewhere where you have to keep your voice down. Kind of, yes. <clears throat> oh, where are you? I was in the middle of a meeting um, with FEMA and I walked out. <laughs> oh, geez. An important meeting with FEMA? It kind of is, but I don't want to miss this opportunity. Well, you know, you've been on my list before, and we haven't been able to connect. And I, I just know. was so disappointed every time I couldn't get you because I love the title of your book, Mac the Sock, Welcome to Sock World. Is this Thank about, you. like, the socks that you never find? That's exactly what it's about. I and hate that. that. And not only that, but it was important for me to do this because half of the proceeds for the book are going towards the fight against sex trafficking in third world countries. So it's crucial that I let that message out. Make that connection between what sounds like a pretty lighthearted book and sex trafficking? Yeah, well, because um, I have five kids and, you know, I'm just so thankful to God for my children that they, you know, feel safe and feel wonderful. They're grown women and men now. And I don't know why my heart, God just put in my heart of, that I needed to do something and help out these kids that don't have an opportunity. And it's a cycle that, you know, in some of these countries that they just don't break. So one time my kids lost one of the socks and I, you know, as a joke, I said, Oh, I went to sock world. And that's how I came up with that idea. And then something, you know, God just put it in my heart, like, you got to write a book about it, and half of it is going to have to go towards fighting sex trafficking. Okay, what's the story? It's the storyline is how kids were, were frustrated because they were doing their laundry, they couldn't find the second pair, and then their mom tells them, you know, the storyline of where do they go? When you wash them, they go over to Sock World. So it's a great book because it kind of tells you where your sock is going when you can't find it. I have one question. Can you get it back? We don't know yet. We don't know? We don't know yet. Maybe. How do you explain when the sock is stuck on the back of a sheet that you took out of the dryer? It didn't go in through the magical window. Oh, that's the next book, right? <laughs> that would be the next book. <laughs> the socks are gone. They're gone. You have to accept it. 
you have to accept it. They go into another world. And it's been cute because I've had feedback where people have called me and said, hey, we were missing socks and we thought about sock world or the kids are like <laughs> putting in socks to see if they can they can go meet their their matching their lost pair. <laughs> what do they do in sock world? Do you go into that? Yeah, it, the book goes into like um, it's a whole world where you have um, a daycare, you have an office, you have a medical building, you have lawyers, you have schools you have cheerleaders so it's a it's just a whole new world it's just a it's i mean you can take the book and use it for many things but one of the things you can use it for it's to say that you can adapt and when you enter into a new situation you can just learn to adapt into the situation that you're in do the socks become like the mayor of the sock world i mean do the socks become characters they do become characters so mac the sock meets um demi and um she's been a resident to sock world for many years and she introduces mac and she shows him the town center she shows him the daycare she shows him the you know the the soccer field where there's different socks playing so she introduces him to the new world of all the different things that you can do and all the different socks of all different sizes shapes colors that all come into the sock world and and the kids are like wow now i know where my socks went correct do we just keep adding to the sock world? It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. We can just, yeah, as you know, um, you know, you know, we're, this is the first one. I have gotten numerous requests like, hey, when's the second one going to come out? <laughs> um, I'm like, well, let's focus on the first one. But um, it does leave it open because Mac goes to sleep and, you know, he's awaiting a new adventure. So, yes, it it does evolve to other adventures where you would get to meet other characters in schools and fire stations. Um, basically, you know, where he is in just a little bit more control because before he was just either warming up somebody's feet or somebody's hands or being used as a sock puppet. And now he's actually, you know, he's got a purpose to a certain degree. He has a purpose. Correct. And so we, we end the book and he's waiting for his next adventure. Correct. How are you telling people about this? Um, well, we do have an uh, Instagram page, Max the, Mac the Sock. We've done a book reading and we're lining up to do some more. Um, and a lot of it has been word of mouth. I've had a lot of people, you know, I currently work for FEMA and when people find out, they get excited and, you know, they'll get it for their kids. And a lot of people feel it's a great book to help, um, especially people that have gone through disasters, to adapt into a new situation. Because that's all you do is deal with disasters, right? Correct. And, you know, my, my family's, we're around a lot of healthcare. I have, my husband's a firefighter. My daughter's a nurse. My other daughter's studying to be a physical therapist. So it's about helping people and just making a difference and having that purpose to do something. That is so cool. Josefina, what a great idea. Thank you. All right. Well, listen, get back to your meeting. I don't want to keep you. Okay. I can't wait to see where Mac goes next, though. Yeah, so it's the unique book, and I really hope that, you know, people get out there, they read it. It's the characters, something that you can relate to, and it's just the characters are just amazing. Do you have any radio characters? Anybody on the radio? Not yet. Maybe on the next book. All right, something to look forward to. A master dog trainer, Cheryl Friedman, has taken her therapy dogs to retirement homes and to comfort kids after the Parkland shootings. And she joins us from Florida to talk about a day in the life of Bentley. So what's Bentley's story? Somebody told me one day, they said, you should write a book. So during COVID, I put a book together and, you know, everybody's going crazy over it. This is a COVID book. It's a COVID book. <laughs> I'm going to do a whole show on COVID books. I'm yeah, telling right. you, exactly. so many people were like, you know, I finally found the time to write my book. <laughs> Exactly. Is that funny? I know. It is. Yeah. I do a lot of work at the hospitals and the retirement homes. So they pretty much shut it down, uh, hospitals especially. And then the retirement homes, you could only go outside and see them through the glass. And I just thought that was cruel. I said, I can't do that. To, you know, a lot of them have dementia and, you know, I, I just can't. And now it's gotten to what they make you do is... I dropped off one of his books there, you know, for their activities, you know, to read to the old people because, you know, they revert back to, you know, whatever children. And they all know him for nine years. He's been going there. So what they do now, you have to make an appointment with one person. So if I'm there seeing a Mr. X and Miss A comes by and goes, oh, Bentley, Bentley, she can't see him. 
And I said, I can't do that. You know, so we're, we're just waiting. Now they're talking about opening it up. So if they do, I'll take him back over. Otherwise I tell him, call me on the iPad. You know, he can talk through there. So. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, you know, it seems to me part of the therapy is touching the dog and Absolute. petting the dog and Absolutely. having that connection. Uh, so is Bentley one of your more popular therapy dogs? He's very, very popular. Anybody he meets, they love him. So I started thinking, mm, what is he, you know, everyone said, you should write a book. So I started thinking of what he does daily, you know, little things that he does. So I started putting, he's very photogenic. So I started putting little things that he did together with um little sayings it's like a one or two liners next to it a pledge of allegiance you know the kids don't do the pledge of allegiance anymore so he has a picture with a flag in his mouth and it has the whole pledge of allegiance on the other page you know to show them that and you know stretching and uh, it's just uh it's kind of a very basic book but everybody that has it that has bought it um has said how great it is for the grandkids and their kids and this is a whole children's book on learning teaching children right from wrong like it's got um, always take time to smell the flowers you know respect your parents your brother big brother taught him everything always protect your little sister eat your vegetables you know protect your eyes he's got sunglasses on it's a feel good inside book so it's not really a story it's no learning book it's uh like okay so the first page is he loves his pillows time to take a quick nap before i start my day and then always stretch in the morning and then he's got glasses on do i look intelligent and then take time to smell the flowers and there's flowers and then i took a pledge of allegiance with the flag in his mouth and then a uh, therapy work i love making people smile and then he's got um, running through puddles. I love it when it floods. Uh, daily laps. He's swimming in the pool is a great exercise. Um, <laughs> Do you have pictures of him doing all of these yeah. things? All these things. It's hysterical. <laughs> and he, he's, they're actually not hiking boots. I have a horse farm. They're my riding boots, but he was laying under my desk when he was a puppy. We couldn't find him. He had his chin on one. So I did. I'm waiting patiently to go hiking. I'd love to go hiking. I can't wait. And then you know, it's just cute stuff. What can I get into? And then mama dog and a shepherd raised him. So it doesn't get any better. Always love and respect your mother and father. You know, it just goes on and on. It's just little um, things like he's got a, a tie on and one black tie affair. I love to dress up and then Santa's reindeer. And then he's dressed as Santa and then happy new year with his glasses, <laughs> birthday you know, share, oh, always remember to share on the referee and riding my horse and then guarding my property, playing ball, uh, play fair, um, relaxing after a long day. Friends are so important. Be safe, wear your mask. He's got a mask on. And then always eat your vegetables. It's funny, I sent a picture of that to Libby's and they sent me all these coupons and they're going to use him for the, I said, go ahead. I don't they're going to use his picture? Yeah, I don't care. He gave me green beans. Oh, God, I don't care. Green beans. Well, green, mm. He eats them every day. I guess, and everybody knows you wrote this book. You're dropping this book off at retirement homes and... Oh, kids, to the retirement home that I work at because they all know him. And I bought some extra books. So, you know, they don't get out so they can buy it for their grandkids and, you know, what have you. Um, and if not, you know, they get to see Bentley and he does some therapy is the way I look at it. And... Um, <laughs> It's just been, if you go on Barnes and Noble, um, they, he's got like 12 reviews. They're all five star. I just can't even believe it. I, I was laughing. I was like, oh my gosh. You know, your little book. It's People my little, it. my first little baby book. Yeah. So <laughs> a day in the life of Bentley. I'm looking at the cover. It doesn't look like a golden retriever. It looks like a furry white ball. Exactly. He, well, that's what yeah. he looked like as a puppy. And he's so big. Oh, okay. He's a puppy. Duh. That's a puppy in there. And then it goes through his life when he gets older. But if I, he's 91 pounds. He's a big boy. And wow. I've had people ask me if he's a great Pyrenees because he's a, called an English cream golden. And they have the shorter face and they're blonde. They're really blonde. They're not red. Right. It's a whole right. different. Um, you've seen the Subaru commercial? Yeah. 
that's the breeder I use. The dog in the uh, back is one of their puppies in the little car seat that's yep, yep. So it's 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 cool. It's neat that I'm like my girlfriend's cute. She said Bentley's immortal. <laughs> We're all gonna be gone and he's gonna be at a garage sale for a quarter, but he's gonna live on forever. <laughs> you know? And I didn't even think about it. So I'm like, oh my gosh. So all right, Cheryl, thanks. And we're going to end the show with some food for thought. Who really wants a civil war in the United States? That's the question. Hello? Hey, TJ Barnes, how you doing? This is Alice. Hi, how are you? Where am I calling? Uh, in Daphne, Alabama. Uh, I'm a beach ranger for the city of Gulf Shores. When do you have time to write? Whenever I can. So I do that, and then I just write in my free time. I started writing when I was a firefighter in California still. Four years ago, I moved out here... 18 months ago. Did things get crazy in California? So you were there during COVID. Yeah, yeah. Where, where I was, it wasn't uh, too crazy. They, uh, like, we just kind of ignored the state. Ignored the state. Okay. Yeah, we had we, we had rodeos. We kept our bars open and stuff like that. And the state just hated us. Oh, boy. What town were you in? I was from, from Redding, California. Okay. That's where I grew up, and I moved back home after the Army. Is this what inspired your book? Yes. Yeah. I uh, drew I drew a lot of experience from my personal experience in the Iraq war, just what I've seen um, when societies go that direction. And also from what I've seen of people running for their lives in California from the forest fires. And a lot of that, I was seeing that when I was fighting fires reminded me of Iraq a lot. What do you mean when you see them go in that direction? What direction? Well, so I, the road inspired me to write the book is just seeing a lot of people on the extremes of both political spectrums saying that there should be a war and, you know, that's how we should settle this, these de debates. And just from what I've seen, it's kind of, that's where I wrote the book coming from was just a cautionary tale that it's not going to be something easy or fun or interesting or cool like people think it's going to be like. So it's called Bear Flag Revolt, a chronicle of the second mm -hmm. war between the states. It's it's um, mm -hmm. disturbing when people say, yeah, let's have a war. Let's secede. Like, I don't think it's yeah. I don't think people realize it's not easy. Yeah, I think a lot of people and plus a lot of people of uh, the last civil war where there were state divisions. And if you were behind the lines that you were safe. But that's not really the way these low intensity conflicts are fought anymore. Right. And when I was in Iraq in 2004, I mean. The majority of people that were killed there, civilians, were just by sectarian violence. Sunnis, Shias, Turkmen's all vying for control. So how do you lay out your book? So I wanted to follow um, a wide range of characters. So I've got a, you know, um, patriot who wants to, who's fighting an insurgency against California. There's a uh, uh, millennial who is fighting in the California Defense Force to make California safe. And then there's a drug dealer who starts running guns for a California smuggling guns across the Sierra Nevada mountains. And he's just trying to make money and benefit off the situation. And then there's the, uh, a father who is just trying to keep his family out of it and keep his family safe. Okay. So who's your main character? Uh, I would say the two main characters are, are Josh Swayze, who is the right center patriot. And then Lucas Wilder, who is the drug dealer, who is smuggling guns. Okay, so what happens? The, basically, what happens is a, a billionaire oil president who, who wins election, wins re-election, and California secedes from the United States. And it'd be too easy if there was just a um, if there was just an all-out war because California doesn't have an army. So what happens is uh, European Union and many other countries step in and recognize California as its uh, sovereign nation. And so that's why there has to be this clandestine insurgency to destabilize the government and allow the United States to take it back over. It's pretty, it's kind of dark and gritty because that's the way I envisioned it going. And I wanted to tell a story that kind of made people think that maybe we should resolve our issues peacefully first. Do you have any suggestions on how we can do that? Well, I think we just have to understand that both sides are, for the most part, coming from an argument in good faith where we both want the best for the country. You know, we just have different ways of different views of what that is going to be. And I think when you recognize we do have a pretty good system going on and it's been working for a while, we just need to you know, be open minded and talk to each other more. Well, do you think that we can talk to each other? You know, when it comes down to two people, two guys in a bar from two different sides of the spectrum, that they can sit down and discuss their differences. But it's social media that's driving the wedge between us? Yes, I believe that is definitely the case. I mean, 
again, I can talk to anybody. I have conversations all the time with people who I don't see eye to eye with. But I think, again, when you get it's, it's like road rage in your car. You know, you've got that separation between you where someone cuts you off. You know, it's easier to get angry and, and exacerbate the situation as opposed to if you bumped into someone in Walmart, you would just say, excuse me, and move on with your life. Right. Where, where does the book take us? So it takes us from the beginning where there's the um, where California just slowly because there's going to be economic sanctions like uh, the United States usually does with countries that act out. And so we follow it through this economic decline and the so- social decline and security decline. And so at the end of this book, we end it with the, um, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but basically the rebel army has to retreat to the mountains to regroup. That's the cliffhanger. Yes. All right. You're going to be back with the next book. Yep. That's what I'm working on now. And you wrote this book before COVID even happened. So yes. yeah. what happened? Well, it was, California. people have always talked about California starting its own country. You know, it's always like growing up, I always used to hear, well, California, you know, it could be the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. So I've heard that for a long time. And then it was right after the 2016 election, I started hearing a lot of people that I knew, you know, repeating that and saying, well, now is the time we should do it, you know. And they kind of but I think they ignore they ignore the fact that there's going to be a struggle. You know, the, no, the United States, just like in 1861, isn't going to just let a state leave, you know. So I think a lot of people that's that's what inspired me to write is just people saying that this could happen. This is a legitimate idea. And I so I wrote it just in the in the, you know, 2018, 2019 time frame. So did something happen that made you say, oh, I got to write this book now? It was actually uh, a Facebook argument. Somebody said that we should do it. And I said, well, here's what's going to happen. And I, I listed all the things I cover in my book. You know, there's going to be societal collapse. There's going to be violence. There's going to be sectarian, sectarian violence. And I kind of was just read what I what I've listed and thought, wow, this would be a really cool story. And so I wrote it just as like a alternate history, you know, some type, type of political thriller book. And then, you know, as I was writing, a lot of things I wrote ended up like going on in California. As you were writing. As I was writing. Yeah. People like what? One the main in- instance is uh, California has to come up with to, to battle fake news during the war. They come up with the, the Department of Information. And then we just saw, you know, the government last year came up with the Department of Disinformation, you know, the gov- disinformation governance board for Homeland Security. And so I have a lot of friends that have read it. They read it. They proofread it while I was writing. And they'd always joke and say, man, you need to put the winning lottery numbers in here. Uh, so you were kind of uh, seeing the future almost. Yeah. Um, just in how they handle things and um, how the uh, uh, the gangs and stuff like that form. I remember as of writing, there was a there was a gang in in the in the mountains that were you know smuggling drugs and guns into California while I was writing it. Well, it was local news, and so my buddies were like, "Dude, this is just like these characters, you know, Lucas Wilder up in up in the mountains." So, and you were writing about them and then it happened. Yeah. So it's just little things like that. And then that's how states eventually always need to get more control in order, especially during times of war, how they use wars to, you know, add more security, just like the Patriot Act in 2001. Right. And that was because they needed to keep tabs on us in case, you know, we were in contact with terrorists. Yeah. And then, but of course, now we know with, with, the release of a lot of files are monitoring everybody for everything now. Yeah. Yeah. Feels good. Doesn't it? Yeah. So, uh, so while you have all of these complaints about the way things are handled, ultimately you don't think California should secede. No, I don't think so. I think that I don't think any state should really secede at this point. I think we have a, a way to regress our differences and I think we should work to resolve them peacefully before we, rip things up because there's no guarantee that what comes after is going to be better. You know, like for all we, like there's going to, again, like there's people in 2004 when I was in Iraq who didn't like Saddam, didn't like the crazy Sunni, this crazy Sunnis or the crazy, you know, Al Qaeda in Iraq, but they were boxed in because they was, they didn't like us either. And so there were people that became insurgents who had never, you know, didn't ascribe to those beliefs, but simply because they wanted us out of the country. And so I think that once you get into war, then you the the you you have a less less choice of what side you're going to be on. You have one or two sides, and that's it. That's not good because then it's the, the people who have the most power or the most extreme or could, could be the ones that take over. So you know the people on both sides of the spectrum, you know they have goals, they have ideals, but what they end up with 
might not be what they wanted. Like I guarantee you, if you told Cuba in the 1950s that once Fidel takes power, they're going to have this oppressive state with, you know, food shortages, they might and may not have fought for Fidel or fought for the revolution if they thought that's what they were going to get. You just can't believe everything you hear. No, you can't. And yeah, it's unfortunate that that's where we're at. But hopefully people take a look at this and kind of realize that we're not in as bad a situation as maybe it seems. And maybe we should work together a little bit. All right, TJ Barnes, thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. We hope to see you back here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.